Yeah, thank you, Jason. Um, I think it's really encouraging to see the successful establishment in the dryland ecosystems, especially thinking about the pattern we have of long, longer summer drought on the west side. Uh, there's a lot to learn for sure from the restoration work going on in the adjacent ecosystems in other parts of the northwest. Next up is Anthony Waldrop. Uh, he's going to talk about some of the innovative applications of live pole planting. So kind of on a similar topic, how to apply the, uh, the pole system. Anthony is a watershed restoration project manager for the Grays Harbor Conservation District. And he works with stakeholders throughout the Chehalis Basin to implement watershed restoration projects and programs. Anthony, we're all looking forward to hearing your experiences in these projects with managing landowner expectations, reducing erosion, and some of the innovative and lessons learned uh, that you've done with, with the live pole planting. Great. Uh, no, this is perfect um, sort of follow up on what Jason was sharing. Um, and some of the questions that were coming out of that. Uh, really cool to see the, the experimental work that went in on the live pole planting. I know as, as we were, as we've been exploring this uh, in Grace Harbor uh, area in the Chehalis Basin, um, some of those uh, research papers were really important for us to um, be able to check our assumptions and, and help us develop projects. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna be, um, talking about, uh, yeah, the different applications of live pole planting that we're exploring. We're still relatively new to using this technique. So um, we don't have a, a, a large robust set of um, results from uh, different projects, but um, we've got some and, and I'm excited to just share some of those results. The main project that I'll be focusing in on is the Sats Up River Mile 3.5 Erosion Reduction Pilot Project. Um, this uh, project, the, the Sats Up River flows out of the, um, um, the, the Southern Olympic Mountains um, and gets uh, quite a bit of, um, uh, its watershed gets quite a bit of rain during, during the winter. Uh, it's mostly rain that's pretty low, um, not a lot of snow, um, historically in this watershed. I think highest elevations, three, four, 3,000, maybe up to 4,000. Um, so very rain dominated, very um, uh, powerful system. Um, and um, in this system, um, there's a, a, a number of areas that are facing fairly extreme erosion. Um, as you can see in these aerial photos at this site, um, this uh, this piece, this parcel had, um, I think it was, you know, in some spots, 300 foot riparian buffer of uh, about 80 plus year old um, riparian trees. And then um, in some areas, uh, much, much more of, of that. Um, and then over the, over the course of the past 30 years that that buffer has gone away um, and the river is, uh, eroding through uh, her pasture land. This landowner has a grass-fed beef farm, obviously concerned about uh, the viability of her farm and that continued erosion through the pasture and also potential threats to her home and farm infrastructure. Um, interesting for, for this one, she was a, a beef supplier to the Seattle Seahawks, which was a, an interesting anecdote that she shared one time. Um, but uh, yeah, so big erosion issues here. Um, and a lot of that is due to the Satsup River being incised. It has a pretty large natural sediment source, uh, bed load source from the um, continental glacier outwash, outwash that comes from the East Forks Satsup uh, Mason County area. Um, it uh, lacks stable large woody debris, uh, old growth riparian, and uh, as I mentioned before, can have pretty extreme uh, floods and changes in stage. Um, so a lot of landowners in this river valley have challenges with erosion, um, with extreme erosion, especially where it's greater than 50 feet perpendicular to the stream per year. For this particular area and, you know, due to this like, extreme erosion, we're working with this landowner and a couple other landowners on um, a large woody debris, riparian buffer reestablishment project, floodplain reconnection, um, 
But as we all know, due to design and permitting and funding realities, large woody debris projects can take quite a few years to be implemented. And in the meantime, land is being continually eroded away at fairly rapid rates with an eventual goal of riparian buffer reestablishment and all the benefits that come from that. Um, we don't want to plant and see them wash away in an event that takes out a hundred feet of, of buffer. So we wanted to figure out some early project actions that we could do while we continue working on this larger project. Some actions that um, might help reduce erosion, um, but that um, have a better chance of sticking around than the typical um, three to four foot live stakes or, or other riparian plantings um, that uh, um, are not going to withstand uh, the flood flows, especially in an incised system for very long. So we've got this long-term project, which is exciting, but we wanted to see if there was any early actions that we could do to save um, or to reduce, reduce that erosion in the near term. So as a pilot project, we decided to try out a more robust live staking uh, technique, um, very similar to the, the deep planting that Jason mentioned. Based off of the, the, the flood flows and the height of the bank, um, we decided that putting in six foot to 10 foot long willow and cottonwood poles with around a three inch diameter down to depths of four to seven feet um, would give us a, a chance to help uh, get uh, roots established throughout that um, potentially erodible soil column. Our hypothesis was that if we could get them established in late winter and early spring, um, after the most erosive floods, because that, that's what they happen in winter or fall and winter. Um, so establish them after the most erosive floods. Um, and hopefully they would put those roots out uh, and then be resilient to water stress uh, due to their depth. Um, like like uh, Jason was talking about, like water stress is getting more and more important or more and more of an issue, um, even in um, extremely wet uh, Grace Harbor County. And then for, as far as spacing, we space them 10 feet apart with about a 10 foot to 20 foot setback from the existing bank line to ideally give them a bit of room before the river gets to them, especially since we were doing it during times of potential high flows. We knew that the erosion might not be um, over yet and we wanted to, um, to get them established before the, the river started to interact with them. To get them to depth, we used a one person gas powered auger for the first few feet and then a, a pneumatic post pounder to drive the posts as deep as possible. We needed this technique to be quick to implement, not involve heavy equipment due to the really wet site conditions. Um, also, you know, once you start bringing in equipment that can necessitate permits and, and, and that extends your, your timeline. And we wanted to have a chance of erosion reduction. We knew that this technique wasn't going to solve the rapid erosion issues. But even if it didn't, um, it, any poles that would survive would initiate our riparian buffer establishment goals anyways. So it was a really nice uh, low risk early, early action to take. So in, installing this low risk early action was also really important for landowner engagement for this project. Taking this action showed her that we were you know, trying to be as creative and proactive as possible at addressing her major concern, which is the erosion. Um, she definitely cares about the riparian and the salmon, uh, but her her highest concern was, you know, my um, I had a I had a three hundred foot buffer. That buffer is gone, um, and uh, it's now threatening um, uh, farm infrastructure and taking out um, acres and acres of of uh, land that she previously relied on. Um, so her concern is how do we get how do we get this erosion to a more manageable state? She knows that um, rivers naturally erode and that we're not going to be able to stop erosion. We just want to reduce it and, and allow the river to um, to be able to migrate in um, in its more natural way and within a corridor. So we're taking this early action at the same time as working on the high permit, high cost engineered logjam option, it, this implementation allowed our team to start to form project implementation relationships with the landowner as a sort of dry run for the uh, eventual large construction project. 
excuse me, going from design and permitting, um, which often has little to no ground impact for landowners to a full construction effort can be really jarring for a lot of landowners and constrain relationships and communication quickly. So doing this project allowed us to start to work through construction related communication scenarios with uh, much lower stakes, pun intended. Um, these pics show our installation in February, 2022. You can see the, the auger holes on the left and the right. Um, and after augering, we placed the poles in and then brought the pneumatic post pounder to come along and finish them off by pounding them as deeply as we could. The pneumatic post pounder is a really great tool because it's extremely mobile. We use them for post assisted log structures and also for installing these larger poles. Um, the air compressor can be staged at a stable landing site more than a thousand feet away and then hose can be run from the compressor to the pounder. And all you have to do is move around the hose and the filter regulator cart. Um, also in contrast to say a gas powered pounder, you don't have to hold the post pounder while it pounds. You simply place it on the post, you step back like Jeff is doing here in this picture and pull the trigger and the weight does the work. It saves a ton of energy for the crew implementing it. So here's some, some metrics on um, what we ended up installing. Um, we ended up putting in about 350 uh, cottonwood and willow poles. We also, um, because there was a bit of a plantable toe that developed during low water, um, we uh, opportunistically uh, harvested a bunch of willow stakes from the same um, property and installed them as the sort of chasing the water uh, during spring as, as the groundwater or as the water flow went down. We spent about 170 crew hours. It was about a week and a half of crew time. Um, and this was a uh, the stretch of shoreline was 1500 feet. So about a quarter of a mile, a little bit more. Um, overall project cost uh, was 14,600. The main portions being the, the plant material at 5,100 and the labor at 6,100. Um, the post pounder we rented for a couple of weeks um, and it was um, uh, fairly uh, affordable uh, from uh, Perk Rentals uh, in our area. And then we had a little bit of money set aside for monitoring and, and being able to report out our results. And um, wanna acknowledge as well the Chehalis Basin Strategies Erosion Management Pilot program that funded this project. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the different applications that, um, or the, the different benefits of this type of work that we're seeing beyond the erosion reduction. So here we can see you know, the growth season um, uh, starting in April, excuse me, going into July, and then I've got some pictures later of September. Um, one really nice outcome of using these larger poles was that they were very competitive with reed canary grass and some other pretty aggressive riparian weeds. With no maintenance, uh, many of the poles were able to thrive because they could access the deeper groundwater. They started growth a bit earlier in the spring, and then they, they continued to grow later than most of the weed vegetation, which died off during the summer drought. So that gave them a competitive advantage on both of those shoulder seasons, um, and they were able to hold their own um, in their first year with uh, the rest of the, the vegetation. Another um, application is in a lot of uh, floodplain <clears throat> environments that have large woody debris that flows across um, lower, lower floodplains. Um, that can make it pretty difficult to establish um, plants or, or a, a farmer who has to uh, pick that up out of their field oftentimes is, is looking for ways to keep that woody debris on the, uh, in the riparian area. And so one <clears throat> ancillary benefit of this, this is a different project here where we use them, is the installed live poles act as a, a, a pseudo flood fence. Um, and um, on the left picture, that, those are Douglas fir poles that are that's in a flood fence array. Those those aren't going to grow. Um, and that shows the capture of woody debris. But on the right, we can see one of our poles that was able to withstand a, a fairly large um, um, log that came down the river and 
hold it there. So I think that's a really exciting potential is um, if you, you put a, a decent array of these, they can help build that riparian woody layer. Another benefit um, on an application is uh, rapid riparian vegetation establishment. So these are some of our September photos um, here of <clears throat> the, uh, on the left you have um, schoolers willow, which um, we measured the length of the, the longest shoots um, and also counted how many stems and um, had a baseline data on the length of pole and how far it was put underground. Um, so both the schoolers willow and the black cottonwood on the right um, were able to get seven to eight feet of um, new growth on, on their longest shoot. Um, and with, with the importance of shade and riparian vegetation along our waterways, it was really encouraging to see this rapid and robust growth. Um, and so we've started to incorporate these poles in many of our riparian projects, even if there's no, you know, there's no erosion issues. Um, the cottonwood especially acts as a really great early successional floodplain species that can provide shade protection for slower growers, such as cedar and spruce. And for our project development, this can help us because a lot of project and funding timelines don't allow for a 10 year planting project or 20 year planting project where you go in and you do your early successional species, get the alder and cottonwood established, and then come in 10, 20 years later and underplant um, to get uh, some of the conifer species or species that are slower growing, that um, are more shade adapted. Um, and so with this technique, we can cinch together that temporal, that, that uh, temporal lag there. And um, for, for projects where we, we only have a couple of years of funding and try to establish the diversity um, sooner than later where we get a lot of shade right away and companion plant with um, these cottonwood and um, the, the slower grower species that would benefit from the shading. Um, and hopefully that results in a more diverse and resilient vegetation zone um, from just a, a few years of, of planting. So some of our results here, we were really happy with the survival after one year. Um, and it was uh, over 80%. Um, some of the things that we were finding was there was no difference in survivability between cottonwood, Pacific willow, or schoolers willow. Um, or any difference based on pole diameter or length. Uh, what we did find though, was that um, access to water was really important, especially with a really dry summer. Um, so we had a very wet spring last year, wet and cool in 2022, which was great for early growth, but then the weather dried out substantially for July to October. And due to the, depth of many of our poles. Our goal was to get poles down four feet, um, and many of them were. Uh, they continued thriving during that dry period, putting on close to 10 feet of new growth on those st individual stems. However, the poles, some poles that did initially well in the wet spring that put on good growth eventually died during the summer. And looking at our data, we found that this trend was largely driven by depth of pole below ground surface, as well as the substrate. Gravelly substrate, which dries out more quickly, also corresponded with tougher augering and driving conditions. And so in those areas, we were often unable to get three feet below the ground surface. This picture so, shows a section of poles that didn't survive due to the tough driving conditions and the gravelly substrate. But thankfully, those conditions weren't dominant at the site. So it's just a few sections here and there. But the, the ones that went at least four feet into the ground were, um, for the most, you know, more than 99% were successful at surviving and thriving. So this is a, a, a bit of a snapshot of some of the, the monitoring that we're doing, um, as well as a picture of a, a, a landscape picture of from September showing an area that did quite well, where almost every poll has survived and thrived. The spreadsheet above shows the data we have been gathering. The installation data is on the left, and then the monitoring data is highlighted on the right. With this data, we've been able to draw some conclusions that I've shared today, but we've not yet done a robust analysis of the data, but we hope to eventually publish a white paper that shares out the results a bit more formally. And I'd also be really curious 
to hear from folks what other data might have been useful to gather as we were you know moving really quickly on this project and um, trying to gather as much data as we could in, in a short amount of time. Um, and you know with the conservation district we're, we're implementers and we have a little bit less uh, experience on the, the monitoring and experimental sides. So we're always open to learning. Um, and you can see here we've got nice data on you know the bark condition, the soil condition, um, the number of stems and um, also other other various uh, metrics. So back to our original question, um, you know, erosion reduction, are we reducing it? I would say yes, as a, as a theory, yes, because it's, you know, it's impossible to measure to what degree at this point because there's so many variables and we, you know, we didn't establish a control, but we do know that at very little cost, we now have woody vegetation roots established uh, throughout the soil column. The eventual large woody debris project will impact the poles a bit and nullify any sort of pure erosion reduction experimental conclusions we can have over the long term. Um, but it will also give us a chance to dig up and reposition the poles. And I hope to do some measuring of root growth, you know, where, where the roots are growing the most. Um, and, and try to get that data, which, which is something I've, I've been really interested in is, are the roots establishing throughout, throughout the, the, the underground post, um, or is it only in a certain zone? Um, that's really important on the, the sort of soil binding that I'm, I'm interested in. Um, this is a, an aerial here of the, the project site that we took a couple weeks ago. And um, the, we haven't had the extreme floods this year that we um, often do, and um, which is great because hopefully we'll get another year of growth um, on these before they really get challenged. Um, and I think also those really important to try to get stakes and poles in that sort of toe zone um, if you can, because um, that's that's what we've seen naturally on our rivers around here where you get uh, live live vegetation from upstream washing in with a, a slug of gravel getting established at that toe. And then um, once, once you get vegetation coming up in there, it, it serves to capture sediment and rebuild um, soil in that area. So that's, that's we're really trying to experiment with both on top of bank and chasing the water as the water goes down um, during the, the springtime. And finally, uh, some other conclusions and lessons learned. Um, it's a, a really great you know, no maintenance or low maintenance technique to incorporate into a lot of our riparian and wetland restoration projects. Um, you know, it's gonna differ uh, depending on site conditions, but um, if you need to get, for this site, you know, we, we needed to get down more than three feet. And so if we do any additional posts here and we can't get below that, uh, then I think we'd wanna consider either thinning stems to reduce that water need or some summer watering. Um, the ideal size of the material for driving was two inch to three inch. We were, we were a little worried that if we got too skinny that the poles would, uh, wouldn't would withstand the, the uh, pneumatic post pounder, but um, we found that the two inch-ish and above was, was totally fine. So um, rather than have the, the, I think the chuck size for the post pounder was three and five eighths inch, but we really wanted to stay three inch to two inch, and that was that was perfect for it. Um, depending on your local uh, live vegetation suppliers, the size of material could be difficult to source. We, our sub local supplier Salix Solutions was great in helping us find um, this and, and uh, providing all of the poles that we needed. Um, it's a great technique for landowner engagement, like I've talked before, the rapid reveg, weed competition, drought tolerance. Um, and then for this particular project, um, the erosion potential has definitely been reduced, but um, it's uh, um, in a lot of our sites, we, we need that um, large woody debris and, and incision reduction to help with the overall uh, excessive erosion, um, but a good technique uh, regardless. Um, I just wanna acknowledge a, a few um, um, folks and partners and you know, our crews that help landowner, the erosion management program and our, our supplier. Um, thank you.
Thank you, Anthony. Um, so folks in the in the question box are asking about that pounder. They want to know the details. Um, yeah. Um, what's the di diameter? Did you have to trim down the tops of large posts to get them in? So there was a few of the, the posts. Compressor. That, yeah, there were a few posts that were um, a bit larger than the chuck size that we did have to trim down um, to be able to fit the chuck on. And um, we were, I was pleasantly surprised that those ones that had a lot more sort of um, damage to them in installation, they, um, many of them survived and, and were able to thrive, um, but it just made it more work to, to install them. So working with our supplier, we're, we're really emphasizing like we, we, we want it below this check size because it just takes too much manipulation to get the poles to the size that we can fit the, the pneumatic post pounder uh, on it. So um, the post pounder did not damage the poles substantially enough that um, it uh, re really reduced uh, survivorship. We also did cut the, the tops down a bit to leave a, um, you know, just a couple feet, a foot or two um, up above the soil surface. So if there was damage on the top, then you know if we cut that off. That that helped reduce any potential girdling effect caused by the uh, post pounder. Um, what was the size of the um, compressor? And mm. the size of the compressor and the length of the hose. Yeah, I think we were so. I don't really remember the size of the compressor. You know, the, the, the tool is rated for a certain compressor size, which we made sure to line up. Um, and the, the place that we rented from, um, the Herc Rentals, um, H-E-R-C uh, -E Rentals, um, they provided the compressor as well. And so we were able to work with them to make sure we got the appropriate compressor size. Um, for this equipment. And um, the length of hose, um, I think we were up to around 1,200 feet at the longest. Um, I'm really curious to see how far we can stretch it um, to see, yeah, if there's any, what, what, when we find the limitations for being able to use the equipment. Um, because this, especially with our post-assisted log structures, it's really nice to just run hose when you're, um, down into the uh, riparian buffer areas. And was there tree cover removal from 1991 to 2017? No, that was all, all river. Um, so yeah, kind of definitely land landowner was pretty, yeah, been sad about, you know, losing some pretty prized cedars and, and uh, some trees along there. What was the density of the stakes per acre? Um, we had 10 foot uh, on center spacing. So um, I'd have to do the, the math on that, um, but yeah, 10 foot spacing. Okay, then there were more questions about damaging poles, which you've already addressed. Um, How much time elapsed from harvest to planting of the poles? Um, I would say maybe um, at most a month or two. And you know, the our supplier um, is very conscientious of keeping the poles or harvesting in dormancy, keeping them moist, um, keeping them alive, and then when we get them, we do the same thing: keep them from drying out. On your follow-up monitoring, it might be interesting to look at whether the cambium was damaged contributing to mortality. So checking out at your, your guess that the trees yeah. surround. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point is, um, yeah, I wish that for each of the, the poles we had a um, sort of like viewing platform or something that you could look at the soil column, see where the roots are going, see what's happening underground. But I think that would be kind of expensive. 
how do you compare the success of cottonwood stakes with planting larger cottonwood bare root state stock? Um, haven't made uh, direct comparisons as far as survivability, um, but I think over 80% survivability um, is, I think, uh, um, about what we hope for with any of our live stick material. So I, I would say it's, um, uh, we're right on track. And, you know, our goal was 50% survivability because we weren't sure if, or, or that the, the larger material would take as well. So um, it was encouraging to see that the live material is taking, and we're, we're doing some projects with some, you know, um, eight to, to 16 diameter um, cottonwood coming up in a few weeks um, on the Chehalis River, which we're excited to use those as sort of a pseudo flood fence, um, rapid reveg establishment. But those will need, you know, the larger equipment to, to come in for that. So it's, it's more expensive. Have you considered using a water jet stringer? So the same question. Um, I, some of our project partners have um, talked about using the water jet stinger. I think um, I'm still a little bit intimidated by uh, setting it up and also, um, yeah, making sure that uh, we have the right equipment and everything um, to do that. So I'm definitely interested um, for using it. I've seen it used pretty successfully, but um, haven't yet uh, gone down that route. Um, and how long would you wait to plant conifers in these buckers? Um, I think I kind of like to um, you know, depend depending on your 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 project. Um, you know, you can plant conifers sort of right now and see how they do, um, and then but uh, being conscientious to um, their, if there's a little bit of shade to protect them, uh, they're, they're definitely gonna like that. Um, and uh, so if you get a little bit more shade in a couple of years, um, and, but you're also, you know, you don't have extreme competition for them because uh, early on with Cottonwood, Willow, all their, those early successional, they can, if they're planted really densely, they can be very competitive. Um, and um, so you just want to be conscientious of that is the, the spacing when you're putting in your, uh, your other plants and doing other planting. So yeah, not a, it's very, uh, um, depends on the site, I guess I would say. Are there any other questions? I saw Adam had one in the host and panelists chat. Yes, have we used these techniques oh, yeah. on poorly drained areas? And if so, any changes in drainage you noticed after installation? Um, we have a project coming up um, on a really, really poor soil area, very compacted, um, poor drainage. So um, we'll be able to determine there if this is a, a viable technique in that, that's that's one application I didn't um, forgot to talk about was you know really challenging soil conditions. If we can um, get these poles down to groundwater, we might be able to establish some uh, vegetation in areas where other vegetation, even with watering, is having a hard time getting established. Um, so stay tuned. Um, 